The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus said to the chief priests and elders of the people, What is your opinion? A man had two sons. He came to the first and said, Son, go out and work in the vineyard today. He said in reply, I will not, but afterwards changed his mind and went. The man came to the other son and gave the same order. He said in reply, Yes, sir, but he did not go. Which of the two did his father's will? They answered, The first. Jesus said to them, Amen, I say to you, tax collectors and prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God before you. When John came to you in the way of righteousness, you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and prostitutes did. Yet even when you saw that, you did not later change your minds and believe him. The Gospel of the Lord. If you'll pardon a little review, we Catholics know that God did not dictate the Gospel of Matthew to Matthew or any of the Gospel writers for that matter. Our church teaches that the writing of the Gospels was a three-stage process. Stage one was Jesus, what he said and what he did and what he was trying to accomplish by his words and deeds in the situation that he was facing. Stage two was the oral or preaching stage. After Jesus' resurrection and receiving the gift of the Spirit on Pentecost, the apostles and other followers of Jesus fanned out all over the Eastern Mediterranean, telling everyone the good news of Jesus. And in the process, they told and retold these stories of things Jesus used to say, the, the things that he did, and what happened to him as a result. After a couple of decades, if you would have had x-ray vision from outer space, you'd have seen all these little communities of Christian believers, today we would call them parishes, who treasured their favorite sayings of Jesus, their favorite stories about Jesus. Some of those stories would have been the same all over. You can't tell the story of Jesus without the stories of the death and resurrection, for example. But others would be unique to each place because each community had its own issues. And so the preachers who told about Jesus to them would have told different stories than other places got. But whatever it would be, they held on to these stories as very precious. But then came the great Roman persecutions, and in them the eyewitnesses began to be killed off. And people realized, we got to get these stories, these sayings written down while there still are eyewitnesses around who can vouch for them and say, yep, that's exactly what he used to say. That's exactly what happened. And so with that, we've now entered stage three, the written Gospels. But as John's Gospel says explicitly, if everything Jesus said or did were written down, I doubt if the whole world could contain the books that would have to be, that would be needed. So out of all those sayings and stories, stories about what Jesus did that were treasured by their community, the evangelists picked those particular ones that made the point about Jesus that they thought their parish needed to be reminded of them. Because each of those parishes were facing certain challenges, certain wrong understandings of Jesus had begun to surface. And they wrote their books to say, wait a minute, no, remember, this is what we were taught. Remember, this is what he used to say. This is what he used to do. But while they used a very broad outline of Jesus' ministry as a kind of framework, each gospel writer now in that next generation arranged the stories and the sayings of Jesus in whatever way they thought best to make the point about him that they were trying to make. For example, our gospel this year, St. Matthew, organizes the teachings of Jesus by topic by subject matter. He puts them in five sermons. Everybody knows the first one, the Sermon on the Mount. But each one is dedicated to a different topic, a different subject matter, just like the five books of the laws of Moses. It's all very logical, very organized. All this was done, of course, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit who inspired these Gospels. But what that means is that when we look at the sayings of Jesus in the written Gospels, we can often see traces of those three different stages that they went through. 
And that's particularly true of the parables. For example, when Jesus told today's parable in stage one in his own ministry, it was one of many sayings and teachings he used to defend his practice of associating with sinners. People, the proper people, just couldn't get over that. Jesus hung out with the wrong people, the people that proper people wouldn't want to have anything to do with, tax collectors and prostitutes in today's example. So the first son, when Jesus originally told this parable in stage one, represented those righteous people who often looked good on the outside because they were performing all the rituals of their faith. They said, yes, sir, to God, but then they didn't really do what God told them to do. Whereas the second son, the tax collectors and the sinners that, that Jesus reached out to, may have told God no and departed from the commandments in the first place, but now because Jesus' ministry to them, they repented. Metamelomai, which is the Greek verb here that our translation rendered as change their mind, doesn't mean just change their intellectual opinion. It means that they changed their heart. They regretted. They repented that they had done that. And now they turned. And repenting of that earlier sinful life, they now turn to God's will. In stage two, when these stories were circulating orally, this parable began to be interpreted in a different way. See, the preachers kind of struck out with the people you'd think would have been embracing Jesus wholeheartedly, his own fellow Jews. Because once their authorities said that Jesus was not the Messiah and this was a wrong way to go, most Jews followed their authorities. Probably we would have done the same thing. But at the same time, more and more Gentiles like us were joining. They were coming to be believers. So in this stage, the son who said yes to the father, but who in fact did not do what he, what the father wanted, began to be understood as the Jewish people. They were bound to God by covenant. Like marriage vows, they had said, yes, I do. But when they did not accept Jesus, and they were not really doing what the father wanted them to do. The other son started to be looking upon as standing for us Gentiles. See, we had not been doing the law of Moses, which expressed God's will. So in effect, we were equivalently saying no to God. But now, on hearing the good news of Jesus, we changed and embraced God's will. We joined up, we're baptized, we're eager to do whatever God our father wanted. Stage three is how Matthew uses this parable in the, in the written gospel. He finds that this parable works perfectly to express how Jesus saw and condemned the authorities of his day for their unwillingness to accept God, him as God's Messiah. Here in chapter 21 and 22, he sets up the climactic showdown. Jesus does the unimaginable. He makes a whip of cords and overthrows the money changers, stands in the temple, and he drives out the cattle and the sheep that were being bought and sold for the sacrifices. It's a riot. It's violence. It's wholesale destruction of property and the, the corrupt priest's monopoly. They cannot let that go. But they have to be careful because the people at large were cheering Jesus on. They bitterly resented the way the priests were making a killing, demanding that only their animals could be bought and sold and charging a hefty price. All money had to be changed into the temple currency at tremendously inflated rates of you know, uh, charges for that. They would have loved, as we're going to hear next Sunday, they would have loved to throw Jesus into prison and throw away the key, but they couldn't do that. So when Jesus shows his face in the temple again the next day, they are seething. And they demand what right he had to do that. And here Matthew places now three of Jesus' parables, each one stronger than the one before, in which Jesus calls them out. He accuses those authorities of hypocrisy. So fasten your seatbelts. These next couple Sundays are going to be a little rough. But now... It's those corrupt chief priests who are the second son who say the right thing. Yes, sir. 
They appear to be on God's side, but in fact they're not doing what God their Father wanted, but the opposite. Because if they really were intent on what God wanted, they would have gotten behind John the Baptist first and now Jesus wholeheartedly rather than oppose them in order to hold on to their own financial and political power. It's the ordinary people, the sinners who, like the first son, even though they had said no to God before, now are welcoming Jesus and turning to do what God wants, accept him as their Messiah. But you know, all of that, what the meaning of the parable was in the three stages of the gospel tradition, it's just a factoid. It's just a trivia question. The only meaning of the parable that matters is what this parable means to you and me in our spiritual life. We could call that the fourth stage of God's gospel project. I hope that you hear this parable, like the one we're going to hear next week too, as enormous good news as great consolation, great encouragement. Because the fact of the matter is that we can see ourselves in both sons. Look at us. Here we are on the Sunday morning at Mass, saying and doing all the right things. We're saying, we love you, Lord. We'll do anything you ask us to do. But we've done this before. And we know that once we've left the building, so often we haven't done that. We're sinful human beings who in fact often do not do our Father's will, both in what we've done and what we've not done. We haven't worked the vineyard the way he asked us to. We have not really changed Norwalk very much in the last 150 years. But where the parable holds its great consolation and encouragement is in assuring us that the prophet Ezekiel was right in that first reading. It's never too late to become the first son, to change our minds and our hearts, metamelomai. And then the Christ Jesus who loved us enough to, even though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God something to be hung on to, but out of that amazing love, rather emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, coming in the likeness of us human beings, humbling himself to hang out precisely with people like us, sinners, and ultimately loving us unworthy riffraff so much that he was obedient even to death, death on a cross. We can have boundless hope because love like that is boundless. It's mind-boggling. And it's given to us. It's never too late. So let's indeed metamelomatha, I suppose would be the Greek form of the verb. Let's ask the Lord to help us turn from our past imperfect responses and love him with all our hearts and souls and mind and strength and this week to do his will better than last week, and then do even better next week than this. <laughs>